for, <clears throat> I think you have some truth. And I would like to know what that truth is, possibly to incorporate it into my life. And so it's much more than just a sort of passive tolerance. It's an active embrace of various worldviews, all looking for the partial truths that each of them contain, and then finding ways to weave those truths together into a holistic system. And so that's certainly what integral theory and some other um, post-postmodern theories are attempting to do, is not to decide which view is right and which view is wrong, which is sort of an old first-tier approach. But how can they all be essentially right? How can there be truths from all of these systems that have something important to tell us? As we sometimes put it, no mind can produce 100% error, or nobody's smart enough to be wrong all the time. And so we have before us this enormous smorgasbord of um, partial truths that are waiting to be woven together, not just cognitively, but also in our own emotions and ethics and morals and interwoven in a way that shows us the deep, deep connections in addition to the important differences, which are not denied, but the deep, deep connections that we all share as human beings living on this small planet. And the remarkable thing is, once you sort of get the sense of an integral wholeness and the importance of um, drawing on, on all disciplines and having multidisciplinary approaches and transdisciplinary approaches to virtually any problem. <clears throat> and that certainly includes things like global warming. And one of the reasons that we're having problems getting people to adopt procedures to help with global warming is that most of the people working on it are coming at it from just one or at most two levels of development, whereas the rest of the world, some 80% of the world, are at other levels of development. And so they're not speaking to everybody in a language that connects with them. And so they're not talking to individuals at magic levels or individual at mythic levels or even individual at, at integral levels. They're talking at best individuals at a rational level and often individuals at a pluralistic level. But unfortunately, about 70% of the world's population is at mythic or lower levels. And so it, it, it's literally as Robert Keegan, a developmentalist at Harvard, puts it, um, in over our heads. Some of these truths that we just assume are plainly evident to everybody aren't evident to people that aren't at a rational level. This is why it's so common, for example, for fundamentalists of any religion, bless them, but they tend to believe in the mythic truths of a particular book, say the Bible, and they take those mythic truths to be literally true. Moses really did part the Red Sea. God really did rain locusts down on the Egyptians. Uh, Moses really did turn his staff into a serpent. Christ really was born from a biological virgin, and so on and so on and so on. Now, at that particular stage of development, Myth forms a very important function. And during the whole mythic era of human history, it was extremely important because for the first time, separate and individual tribes that could only be related biologically by kinship lineage. So I could only be, I could only know how to relate to you if you were somehow in my extended family. If I met a tribe that wasn't in my extended family, then I couldn't relate to them. And often warfare or fighting was the result. 
But with mythology, both tribes could be descended from the same god and therefore could form a larger union based on that commonality. And so the 12 tribes of Israel, for example, came together under one god, Yahweh. So that mythic worldview turned out to be a, a, a great evolutionary advance for its time. And every child today, starting at around age five or six and going until early adolescence, has that mythic worldview. And so if you want to communicate with an individual at that level of development at all, you have to speak in the language that addresses that worldview. If you come in with, you know, pluralistic reasons, we're all humans and everybody deserves dignity <clears throat> and, um, you know, what's true for you is true for you and what's true for me is true for me and so on, it's right over their heads. Um, as I said, bless them, but um, it's, it's, there are higher stages of development awaiting all of us, really. And I sometimes say this is an elitism, but it's an elitism to, to which all are invited. These are stages of development that are inherent in every human being. And so one of our goals in education is to educate across all of these levels of consciousness, through all those developmental levels, and include all of the different developmental lines or multiple intelligences. And that is covering just the interior of the individual, the so-called upper left quadrant. When we draw this inside and outside of an individual and collective on a sheet of paper, it makes four boxes. <clears throat> and so we sometimes refer to the upper left and the upper right and lower left and lower right and so on. But so in addition to the upper left, which, by the way, is one of the quadrants most ignored by every educational system in the world today, which focuses instead on the upper right, the exterior of the individual and the scientific worldview, and includes things like atoms, molecules, cells, organisms, a study of brain neurochemistry, um, evolution in a considered in a reductionistic fashion where there is no creativity inherent in evolution, there is no spirit inherent in evolution, there is no livingness inherent in evolution. It's just chance, mutations, and natural selection, which increasingly science itself realizes um, could never get us past frisky dirt in the evolutionary sequence, and that, and that the whole evolutionary process is, is the opposite of randomness or, or chaos and actually drives towards higher levels of self-organization and higher levels of complexity and higher levels of consciousness. And that's an inherent drive in the living universe itself. And to the extent that people get in touch with their own living creativity, they're in touch with the living creativity of the entire cosmos. They're in touch with, with spirit. They're in touch with their real self. And all of that gets left out when you look at just the exteriors and leave out the interiors of consciousness and the interiors, the collective interiors of culture. But that indeed is what most educational systems do. And when you focus just on the exterior, there really is no reason for a, a positive hope in the universe. It's, it's really just entropy and everything's running down. And what we've managed to get in terms of um, products of creativity and great beauty and great goodness is just the sheerest luck. And um, if you believe that, then uh, clinical depression is never very far away. And that is the sort of official mainstream view 
of Western culture, unfortunately, is this scientific materialism. And it focuses on the upper right, the exterior of the individual, and then occasionally some avant-garde scientists believe more in systems or systems theory. And so they're focusing on the exterior of the collective. Systems theory still doesn't take into account the interiors of an individual. So you can look at any textbook in systems theory. You won't find anything on beauty, aesthetic, art, uh, morals, ethics, goodness, uh, or any of those interior values. Uh, so if you ask a systems theorist, for example, to help understand the traffic patterns of downtown Manhattan, then they will watch the traffic, and in the morning they'll see a flux as people go to work and then increase in traffic, <laughs> and then it sort of dies off, and then at lunch there's a bit of an increase, and then around 4 or 5 there's a big increase as people go home. And they can chart all of those exterior movements on flowcharts and give you a very good understanding of just how the traffic is flowing on, on any given day at any given time. What they won't tell you is anything about the interior of any of the drivers in any of those cars, whether the driver is at a magic or a mythic or a rational or pluralistic or an integral or transpersonal level of development. So all of human motivation for why people are driving those cars is left out of the picture. And, of course, if you leave intentionality out, and creativity out, and motivation out, you're going to get a universe that looks dead. And that's exactly what scientific materialism does for us. Now, of course, what the integral approach does is it doesn't say that science is wrong. That would be to fall into the same either-or thinking. It says that that kind of science is true but partial. There are some very important truths that we've learned from reductionistic science. At the very least, it's added probably three decades to the average lifespan of human beings on the planet in just the last three or four hundred years. And it has put a man on the moon, something even our best of poets can't do. So we're not advocating throwing that out. It is, as a matter of fact, one of the major quadrants that we advocate learning about. But we are saying, add the other three quadrants and look at all the extraordinary facts and truths and values that you'll find residing there. And these can be, most of these can be tested. The simple fact they're interior doesn't mean they're private or inaccessible. Uh, most of the great developmental models, for example, have developed uh, testing procedures that can determine very accurately at which particular level an individual is. And so um, it's, it's not that the fact that they're interior uh, means that they're inaccessible or, or that we can't get at them. Even things like mystical awareness or spiritual awakening or enlightenment, even though it, it in a sense, is a, a, an experience that an individual has on their interior, it's still something that can be trained in a community of other practitioners by masters of a practice that will help you awaken to your spiritual dimension and actually experience a Satori or a Kensho or a Metanoia or a transformative practice. The many of these traditions have been passed down hundreds, even thousands of years, which if they were perfectly private and inaccessible, wouldn't be able to be passed from one person to another, let alone through thousands of people over hundreds of years. So the notion that the interiors, the entire left-hand quadrants, are somehow inaccessible or can't be proven is nonsense, utter, absolute nonsense. 
And so this is, of course, just one of the ways that we integrate science and religion and point to the importance of, of the truths that both of them have to offer us. So it's um, with, with that sort of brief overview, um, perhaps I, I, should, I should pause and see where we'd like to go from here. And also I know we have uh, some people that want to ask some questions. And of course we want to do our best to accommodate them. But I'd just like to, to finish by saying that um, there is now strong evidence that a significant percentage of the world's population is undergoing a major evolutionary transformation in consciousness to levels of consciousness and awareness that are literally historically unprecedented. And their capacity for holistic, inclusive, embracing both and thinking is unprecedented and has literally never existed on this planet in, in history before in any significant fashion, but is looking now to become the leading edge of human growth and development. And the impact of that is, is simply impossible to overestimate. It uh, promises to be profound, widespread, and enormously positive in, in almost all of its ramifications. And if we are indeed going to handle the global problems that we're facing now, and most of mankind's problems are global, global finances, global terrorism, global warming, we're going to need correlative global thinking. And that's exactly what's being delivered by these deeper, higher, wider levels of consciousness and awareness. And the sooner we get educational systems that are aware of that and start to educate people on how to live in this interwoven, interconnected, living, creative, spiritual universe, then the sooner we're going to produce the citizens of tomorrow who will actually be inhabiting this extraordinarily new world. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Yes, Julian, um, nice to hear your voice again. Uh, Ken, thank you for your 